Right. Thank you all for uh, showing up uh, in uh, large numbers. Cool. Nice. <laughs> uh, I'm. Uh, Nate. I assume uh, most of you uh, are here because you somehow are responsible for maintaining a Drupal website, right? Um, and one of the things that comes with maintaining a Drupal website is keeping it secure. Like, uh, the good news is that Drupal provides updates for you, uh, but there's also a little bit of bad news there, because Drupal, especially if you're using quite some contract modules, Drupal provides updates every week, uh, which is cool, then you need to update your website like every once in, every once in a while. Most updates usually then uh, apply to every configuration set, so uh, you need to look at the updates and say, okay, this one applies to me and this one doesn't. But the, the problem is that if you have a lot of websites, then that becomes like a lot of work. Um, the good news is then that Drupal also has some way of doing automatic updates, but if you work at an agency, then you probably have all your code in version control. You don't want your production website to automatically update, and even if, it, if that would work, then the moment that you deploy the new version of your website, then those updates are gone, if that even works at all, because I don't know, has one of you seen damp rating a Drupal website work fine? I've never seen that work. So that's that's a bit of a problem, right? Um, and then you're basically back to we need to update the website every maybe even every week. And then the weekly update window becomes a thing that haunts you in your sleep. <coughs> Because imagine if you have like 60 websites and every week you're working like to update all of them, then you need, I don't know, depends on how much time you need to update them, but let's say it takes you about an hour, then that's more than a man week per week that you need to spend on updating them, which is a problem, right? Um, that's the problem that we're trying, that we have tried to solve at Swiss. Uh, I'm Rolf van der I work at Swiss as an architect. Uh, at Swiss, we, we say we try to improve the world a little bit. Every project, at a, whoa, what happened there? Update. I don't know what happened here. This is uh, interesting. Let me see what happens if I just reconnect the HDMI cable. If that doesn't work, then... Because my computer is still claiming that it does, like... It, uh, but it says HDMI no signal. I don't know, man. What? Uh, I don't have it on the USB stick, but I do have it in OneDrive. <laughs> I don't know why this doesn't work. <laughs> I tested this. <laughs> but not with the setup here. Maybe. Let me see. Wait, wait, wait a second. Maybe something's changing? No, no dash. All right. Beta, how do you mean? Oh, it's the same. Yeah, come. Like the stars at the beginning. But I think it's. It's another problem. It's that the, 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 the whole system that we're connecting with is down. It's this thing that is the problem now. It's a, uh, I'm pretty sure that is also not going to work. Just the 
program is not full. It's, it's this thing that's down. Okay, cool. Uh, maybe we can find some technical person who is responsible for this. <laughs> Uh, the, 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 we, we, we debuted it to, uh, the problem is not the HDMI output of my computer, the problem is that we moving, move the HDMI output of my computer into some box that also does things with streaming and stuff, and that box broke down. So, and I don't know anything about the details of that. <laughs> Yeah, pull the plug. Yeah, I did. First thing you try, right? Pull the plug, put it back in. Yeah. Um, I think I can get a long way without the PowerPoint, so I think I'll just try that. But at some point, I also would have wanted to show a little bit of code. Uh, <laughs> Something is better than nothing. I'll try. The, uh, what I can do. Um, let me see if I can do this. Yeah, then I at least have my notes. That's the good thing. Um, so uh, I was at the point that, that, uh, uh, that I was telling that uh, we tried to do uh, to improve the world a little bit, and we call that sustainable digital transformations. And one of the parts of sustainable for us is also that we are able to keep the websites that we are running. Uh, actually running for a long time. Uh, and I think we're quite successful with that. We currently have about 60 Drupal websites running. Uh, and uh, we have up to, uh, we have our update process uh, automated up to a point that we have, uh, we take about a day to update all 60 of them. That is, if, uh, if it also includes small other changes, uh, if it's just a security update, then we can do it in three to four hours, sometimes even less. Uh, so that is a lot better than one hour per site. Uh, yeah, then I wanted to show a screenshot of a website that Bjorn also already mentioned. We have the website for the Nationale Ombudsman which is a, a semi-governmental organization in the Netherlands that uh, helps people with the conflict with the government. Uh, we started that website uh, still in the alpha versions of Drupal. It was alpha 14, if I'm not mistaken. And that website is still up and running and still included in the process, updated every, uh, every time we need to update it. It's now a Drupal 9 website where it's perfectly fine. So that process actually worked. Um, if technique serves me well, then uh, I'm, I, I, I hope to keep this, the, the talk part, uh, a little uh, around 15 minutes, but that will probably not work with all the technical problems. Uh, so we also have some room for discussion to see okay, how, how you me. guys try to solve those problems, because I'm pretty sure we're not the only ones uh, with these problems. Uh, but I'll, I'll focus now on what we do. Uh, the first thing is that uh, we, are, we, we are quite entrenched in the Atlassian landscape. So uh, every time I say Gitbuck, I just mean generic code hosting. The, the principles still apply. Uh, every time you say Jira, insert your own project management system, we'll probably, it, will, it will probably apply. Um, so the, 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 the first thing that we, uh, that we do to make the updates go well uh, is that we have CI CD in place. That I think is pretty essential to make, uh, uh, make a system, a, a, a semi-automated update system work. Uh, so we have different pipelines every time. Every code change that we do is in a pull request. The pull requests uh, are automatically check for code style, the tests are run. To be fair, not every project has a very extensive pro uh, test set, but at least 
during the test. Every website does a clean install from the source, which already covers a lot of code in Drupal, uh, and also uncovers a lot of problems if there are some, and most projects at least have some basic tests, like does this page actually show up in the output? Uh, moments, and some projects that have some more business logic have even more tests. Um, and then we, uh, don't, then we review those pull requests. Uh, we actually do code reviews. Uh, and uh, then we merge it to uh, develop or master develop for executive and master for production. And uh, for uh, that, then when we merge it, it, we also do code style check to uh, the tests. Uh, we build the assets using uh, NPM and then we deploy to acceptance or production and that all happens automatically. Um, so that part of deploying the updates is already completely automated away. I hope most of you already have something like that in place. Um, then the update process itself, what we do is we, uh, we wrote a script which is basically able to take the code of a Drupal website and update it. Uh, I'll go into details of that script in a minute. But uh, the idea is that that script runs every Thursday night between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m., well after the Drupal updates were published on Wednesday evening, but before anybody starts working on Thursday. Uh, then, uh, and what that script basically does, it runs the updates, and it already creates pull requests for applying the updates for every project. So it generates just uh, 120 pull requests, one for acceptance, one for production for each of the 60 sites. Um, and just like it completely automatically. Um, and that is also running like this uh, this Thursday. Uh, I'm not even sure what the current when the current update window for Drupal 4 is. Uh, but uh, uh, on every Thursday morning. <laughs> I'm not sure I was doing this. <laughs> okay, uh, so every Thursday morning we take this, uh, we, we take a look at the updates that Drupal published and we assess uh, the security risk involved with that update and whether we need to apply that update immediately or that we can, for example, uh, let it wait in mode form. In our experience, uh, we impose certain standards upon ourselves on how to use Drupal and how to use the country. Uh, we have at least so many Oh, okay, okay. This is going to be dangerous. No, this is good, this is good. Uh, Let's see if this works, guys. <laughs> yeah. Where did switch on? Do do it. Yay! <laughs> All right. Thank you. We're back. Uh, so every Thursday morning, we we check the updates. We assess the security risk involved. In our experience, um, especially when you impose some standards upon yourself on how you want to construct your Drupal updates. Uh, or your Drupal website is that uh, the, uh, the, a lot of updates basically boil down to if you already have way, a lot of permissions that allow you to completely deface this website, then you also have some other way of doing that, um, which I'm not saying is not a security risk at all, but it's not something that we rush to fix uh, because, yeah, that, that assumes that the editor, we kind of assume that the, the, the editors of our websites are not malicious actors, uh, which makes the security model a lot simpler. Uh, so based on the assessment, we plan the update moment. Sometimes when it's a very urgent update, we just start updating right now. Uh, sometimes uh, we, uh, we say, okay, this can wait until the next core update, for example. Sometimes we say, okay, we don't have to update immediately, but after we can do it. Uh, depends on the update. Uh, and then on that update moment, what we do is we, uh, we start, at, uh, we just run through all the project. We start at the easy ones, uh, because 
you know, every organization has the projects that are updated easily and projects that are sometimes a bit more of a hassle. Um, we, uh, so we, we started each month and we just review that merge request, see if there's anything, uh, if there's nothing weird in it, if it's okay, then we just merge it, automatically deploy it to acceptance, we check the website on acceptance, and if it's okay, then we do the same thing with master and production. Uh, because that process of merging and deploying and stuff like that is mostly automated, because, uh, because the pull requests are uh, very much alike, because they're all updated in the same way and the code is much alike. Also, the, re the first review takes a lot of time, but then after that, the, uh, they become much quicker after that. Uh, I don't know. Well, uh, so now that we have the process of what we do when there's pull request clear, there are two possible pieces remaining. The first one is what does that script actually do? How does it work? How does it create those pull requests? Well, uh, uh, that script consists of two parts. One part that does the, the actual code update, so you just give it a working copy and it does the update. Uh, the other part is uh, the one that does the git matching, so it creates the commits and it creates the, uh, the pull request, those kind of things. So first code update, uh, the basic idea is we install the project using current code, so this is the process that we use for it, compose and install, create a database, install the website using existing config, if it's required, do something with important translations, and do a config import. Then you have the website as it's intended, no content, but that's fine for the update. Uh, and then we do the actual update itself. So uh, we just run Composer update with all dependencies, and after that we do a Composer install. In some situations that may or may not be necessary, we do have some custom scripts in our Composer install that, uh, that, that do some asset publication. So we, we're moving some assets from uh, vendor packages to other directories, and that is required to make the update go well. So we do also do a composer install, but it may or may not be always necessary. We do a cache rebuild, just to be sure. Uh, something wrong? Uh, you core rebuild, but uh, you have to have uh, What? Yeah. You have to cache rebuild, so it's a core rebuild. Is it core rebuild? Yeah. Cache rebuild. Uh, you sure? <laughs> it's like a cache clear, right? Yeah, 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 I think you rebuild like you contain. Okay, whatever. You do something with the cache, you don't trust CR, but then written out. Um, we do update and updb because the tricky part of Drupal updates is that it also contains config changes, usually. So uh, we do updb, then Drupal will automatically uh, apply those config changes. We config export and then we have those config changes we can, we can commit them later with the entire update. Uh, as I said we do some things with assets with using npm so we also do the uh, npm uh, update. Uh, very straightforward actually. Uh, and this, this is the part that actually creates the, the, the updated code. Around that we have a script which uh, basically, what it, for master it's very simple, uh, what it does, it checks out a new branch, it takes the master branch, latest version, create a new branch, uh, run that script that we discussed a minute ago, and then commit the results, the, the code of that script uh, outputs next to the actual updated files, it also outputs two extra files, one is the commit message, uh, which contains information on what it actually updated, uh, and the other is the compose, it is the pull request text, so the description that goes into the pull request that also contains the output of Composer outdated. So that shows a list of packages that could not be updated for some weird reason. Um, but that result is committed, pushed to a branch, and we create a pull request. We do the administration of the of our changes in Jira, so we link. All those pull requests automatically use to a Jira ticket, so uh, we can always take a look at which project did we update, what update was it, uh, have some communication around it uh, with 
clients that we really, really need to do that kind of things. Uh, develop is for us a little trickier. The reason that it's trickier is because uh, sometimes we have features on develop which are not on production yet, and you also don't want, we don't want them to be on production. And in some cases, we also have small changes made to master without them going to develop. We call those hot fixes. Try to avoid them, but sometimes for quick and easy to fix bugs, we take that approach, especially because then we avoid having to merge develop to master, which may contain a lot of other things that you don't want to merge. Uh, but during that update process, you don't want to lose those changes. So what we do is we check if develop is actually equal to master, if it's the same, then we just merge in the update master branch, which already contains all the updates and we don't have to run that update script again. Uh, the bit run pipeline minutes also cost money, so uh, if that saves us a few minutes, that it makes sense. Um, otherwise, what we do is we merge the master, uh, so then we have all those hotfixes that are applied to master but not yet to develop. Uh, then we run a code update script and we commit everything. And then after that, we do a merge of update master uh, with strategy hours. And the idea of that is that we then create a merge commit, which makes Git think that all the changes of update master are actually incorporated in our code. But in practice, that merge commit doesn't change any code at all. Uh, but that uh, solves uh, merge conflicts that you will have if you don't do this. Because if you do, otherwise you have two updated branches, you could never merge them together anymore, unless you solve all conflicts, but if you do this, then it works. Um, so that is basically the script that we run. This runs every uh, every Thursday night, and it creates a pull request for, for us. Uh, then, then we have all those pull requests and we have uh, an explained process of how we handle those pull requests. Then there are, uh, I promised you at the start that there were two missing crystal pieces. Uh, there's one, uh, this is the title, there's only one, the concept, contents of that script. Uh, the remaining puzzle piece is that this process works best if your projects look a bit alike. Uh, if all your projects are wildly different, then this process is not going to work very well because then, one, all your pull requests are going to look wildly different because there's a lot of different changes. Uh, and the other reason is that, uh, that you all, if, if a project, uh, if you have in your organization, you create a project and every time you do that project, uh, do a new project, and you have some new ideas about how things might be a little bit better if you change some incremental thing about how you develop it. And if you keep doing that, then at some, at some point you have like a trail of legacy websites behind you. So essentially the moment that a website goes live, you already start a new project. And that new project already has new ideas, and so the project already becomes sort of legacy the moment that it goes live. And we try to avoid that. Uh, we avoid that in two ways. One is that we try to work with incremental changes, so we don't change our complete way of working for a new project. Uh, and the other thing that we do uh, is that we in this update process, we also incorporate changes that are not actually updates, but make our projects the same. So the moment that we think of some incremental change, then we also think about how are we going to automate that in such a way that we can apply it to all the projects. Uh, so that's what we do in our update process as well. We change our projects a little bit to keep them alive, which makes updating them a lot easier. Uh, that's about the process itself. Then there's one more thing that I want to tell, and that is we also use this exact same process for our Drupal upgrades. We used this process already for Drupal 9, and we're currently using it to prepare for Drupal 10. So what we already did is, with that incremental process that I told you about, uh, that uh, we already added PHP, 
PHP style to every project so we can check for deprecation notices. Uh, and now we can check. What? Don't move your arm. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so we check the project for deprecation notices and, assume, uh, and uh, we are now working for, through all the projects to check those notices and uh, see if we can fix them. Uh, currently, uh, and we currently already create in that update process a branch for the upgrade for every project. Currently that still fails because we have, uh, uh, we also use some contributed modules which are not triple tank ready, but as soon as they are ready, then that process will hopefully automatically be okay. And we also have that same strategy with just pull requests which are automatically created for Drupal 10. The, when, when we started to actually doing the updates to Drupal 9, how much time did, it, did that took us? Uh, a week. A week, yeah. For all the 60 websites, we upgraded them from Drupal 8 to Drupal 9 in a week. Um, which I think is very impressive. Um, so, in summary, make sure that you use CICD for everything, not just for your updates. Uh, have, a, have an automated script that create, uh, creates code changes that incorporate in that process that you already have for all the other code changes and make sure that your projects don't differ too much from each other. Keep them alive. Uh, and the, the end result is, I think, for us, very important. We can keep our website secure in relatively little time. That's the day. That's the day. Uh, and if, we, if it's just a security update, for example, when, uh, when, when we expect uh, uh, the, the kind of security updates like the Drupal Gather were announced up front, when we know that, then we disable all the, web, all the other changes that we have uh, lined up. Then the moment Drupal Gather comes out, uh, we have pull requests with just that change, and then it's just a matter of version. Thanks. Uh, I hoped to keep some time for discussion, but that didn't work very well because of the technical problems that we have. Uh, but maybe we can claim a little bit of time. Is there a, a, a people lined up? Two, there is. Two, two to three minutes, I get a signal. I, I hope you mean minutes, not seconds. Uh, questions? How do you cope with um, uh, if an update fails because of composer patches that do not apply anymore? Uh, we we keep that in our process where we, uh, we have the room for making uh, uh, the small changes that I talked about. And one of the small changes that we do is uh, removing patches that no longer apply. So we, we wrote a little uh, patch script. Curve. This this is what I have to tell you is all written in patch. Uh, so we have a little bash script where that allows us to manipulate composer packages, uh, and we can just say make sure that when you update to this version, remove this package. What about the similarity? Uh, about Sorry. The similarity between projects. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, uh, uh, we do two things. Uh, the first thing that we that I that I think is something that I already told about, like. We, we, make, we make the same choices in every project, so uh, we, keep, we try to keep our set of concert modules that we use relatively limited, uh, and we all use them in the same way, the way their fields are named, we have a substandard for that. We also have, uh, like, I assume every agency has that some sort of start pack for a Drupal website, that something that you already have which contains the sum of the things that you want in every website, well, we have that as well, which already start, creates a common base. And it's just something that we are actively working on, on every project. But we have some team-to-team -team communication to make sure that we make generally the same choices for the same type of problems um, to keep the projects alive. Because yeah, otherwise, if you have two completely separate teams which do completely separate uh, from each other, they, they, they make changes and you run into problems. For example, with the updates, but also with general maintenance. Last question. 
You're not only doing security updates. Uh, that's correct. That deliberate? Yeah. Because uh, that also means there's a, bit, a bigger chance that some, something breaks. Yeah, the chance is big that something will break, but also if you don't do the normal updates and just do, just do the security updates, then you can quite easily run into the situation that you're not updated enough to apply the latest security update. Uh, so we try to avoid that and keep everything as up to date as we can. Uh, because security updates are usually just uh, published for the latest version. Yeah, and but my next question is, how do you, does that mean that, that will mean that every Thursday there are updates? Because they're not every Thursday. Update, That's correct, or but do you I, apply them immediately or do you No, our decision on applying those updates is based on whether there's a security update or not. But do you then uh the still the PR is created? Yep. Yeah. And do you still merge that one no. or do you just ignore it? We, we ignore them. But you see if the the three threads yeah he goes again and sees if it's eligible and if that's wrong and correctly it's okay. So you have like a history of things that work. If it breaks at some point, then you know when it breaks. And we have like, like, like just, well, we do monthly updates, so every month we update everything, we go share the web. So why wouldn't we? Uh, but if there's, if there's our one, if there's updates released, we apply them, we get, again, we get notifications in Slack, things fail, so we know up front if it's going to work. But we only do it once a month. If there's no well, we'll have to stop because the next session is uh, live.